Welcome everyone. I'm Mark Bonham. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Canadian Business History Association. And uh, this welcome to another edition of the CBHA Talks, a very popular online uh, webinar series. As you know, the Canadian Business History Association is dedicated to the pursuit of Canadian business history and its role both domestically and in world business history. And one of the things that we do is the CBHA Talks, amongst many other things. Our membership consists of academics, business leaders, students, archivists, and the general public. And anyone who would like to consider joining our organization, which we encourage, please uh, visit our website, cbha-acha.ca, and you will find more information about how to become a member. We're very active in the community. We award a lot of scholarships, grants, research funding for uh, business history topics. We uh, have conferences. We also award the best book in Canadian business history every two years. Um, these are just a small, some of the small things that we do. Um, the CBHA Talks is one of our more popular programs and we try to make them very topical and that's no exception today. In fact, we've got a very topical subject matter today, do CEOs matter? I say it's topical. I mean, just look at the turmoil in uh, Canada with Rogers Communications over the past uh, few years and the change of CEOs and, and other things going on in that company. Globally, of course, we have dealing with the uh, banking crisis today and uh, the role of the CEO, I'm sure is going to be uh, uh, brought to the fore on that uh, as we dissect that issue. And look at the issue of Tesla and Twitter and uh, who's running running those two companies and the front page news around that and the shareholder attention being focused on on CEO attention to the to the company. And then even yesterday or two days ago, um, the former CEO of uh, UBS Bank was brought back to help uh, in the integration of the UBS with um, with with the other large Swiss bank. So um, lots of news around the issue of the CEO. So this is a very topical topic and we've got some experts here to help us navigate this issue. I'm gonna pass this over to Rick Powers who's gonna be your host moderator today. Rick is the National Academic Director of the Director's Education Program and Governance, Governance Essentials Program at the Rotman Business School. He recently completed his five-year term as the Associate Dean and executive director of the Rotman MBA and Master of Finance programs. He's a recipient of numerous teaching awards and his areas of expertise include corporate governance, ethics, business and corporate law, and sports marketing. He also teaches in Rotman's executive MBA, the Omnium program, the MBA and executive education programs. He's a director of several not-for-profit organizations and frequently comments on legal and governance issues in various media across Canada. And just this week, I learned that uh, Rick is an avid uh, rugby player. So you got to be careful. Um, you don't mess with Rick, I guess. <laughs> Mark, so Rick, thank you. Thank Rick you very Rick. much. I would not say that former rugby player. I'm not crazy. Oh. <laughs> not crazy. No, that was that was a, that was a while ago. But thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. You know, Mark, you mentioned Rogers and the debacle that happened there with the family, you know, quite uh, well, not that long ago, actually, quite quite uh, recently. And oftentimes, we, we've talked about that in our governance program. People like to equate it to succession, you know, the, 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 the what's that on, which it's not on one of the channels there. I don't know what, but you, how many, I suspect a number of us have, have watched the succession. I don't think it's succession at all. I think it's more like Game of Thrones. Everybody loses their head in the end there in that, in that family. So it's, Going on, you know, how much is a CEO worth today? What is their job? You mentioned the pressure that's on CEOs today. Howard Schultz, founder, former CEO of, uh, or one of the founders of, of uh, Starbucks, was in front of a, a Senate committee yesterday trying to explain his role in whether it was union busting in the United States. So CEOs are continually under more and more pressure. More and more stakeholders are coming at CEOs. And where they used to report to the shareholders once once a year at the annual general meeting, that's not happening anymore. They have to have constant interaction with their with their key stakeholders. And the role of the institutional investors is again, as it rises, more and more pressure put on the CEO and the board of directors. Quite frankly, we're very pleased to welcome Mike, Dr. Michael Aldis here today. He's a business historian with an interest in the ownership and organization of firms. 
He is a doctor from the London School of Economics and Political Science and has an MBA from the IE Business School, Madrid. He's currently at Queen's, Belfast, Queen's University of Belfast, where he's an associate professor. His research has focused on understanding the historical evolution of firms involved in international trade and business in the 19th century, investing in how their strategies changed and how these developments influence patterns of globalization. Currently is working on the Leverhulme Trust Grant investigating British CEOs in the 20th century, examining the effect of factors such as personality traits, career progression, and networks on firm performance. He teaches strategic management and international business. Most recently, he is the co-founder and director of the Long Run Institute, a nonprofit inspired by the founder's belief that there was an unfilled need to connect decision makers with the deep historical context that shapes complex challenges facing governments and businesses. The LRI has hosted events that have brought together leading historians, corporate decision makers, and policymakers in the UK and North America. Michael, a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for agreeing to be with us today and welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Thanks also to Mark for all the organization uh, of the event. And uh, thanks then to Dimitri Anastakis, who initially extended me uh, this invitation. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Uh, let me get that up. So there we go. So um, I'm going to spend uh, the next 25 to 30 minutes talking a little bit about some work I've undertaken with colleagues at the Queen's University Belfast. And um, what I want to do is, first of all, address why I think CEOs matter, um, focusing really on three dimensions, thinking about their impact on company performance, their importance for the wider economy, and their importance in society. Um, and then just going to give you a quick overview, very quick overview of our project and some of the ways we've constructed it and the data we've used. Um, and then I really want to think about how across the 20th century, um, the social background, the ways um, in which CEOs' careers have progressed, um, and the structure of their careers has changed, and how and why they've changed, um, and what this then means for our understanding of why they matter now, today, but uh, perhaps more importantly, how they're going to matter and how this is going to change going um, into the future. Um, so I um, let's see if I can move my slides on. There we go. So first of all, I'm just going to start by uh, talking a little bit about why we think CEOs matter for company performance. Uh, and there's a lot of research that's been conducted into this issue. Um, and uh, academics in the field of management have tried to capture what they call the CEO effect, which is directly measuring how much CEOs matter for firm performance, both positive and negative. Um, and the way they do this is they try to control for wider sort of industry and economic factors. Um, and they also then model in this idea of what they call managerial discretion, which is really the sort of the latitude for action that a individual CEO has within a firm. And this could be shaped by sort of the wider institutional environment, national values, corporate governance regimes, ownership structures, all of these factors are going to determine sort of the ability of the CEO to um, uh, sort of implement his strategic vision of uh, for the company. And when you account for all of these factors, um, it turns out that actually the effect that CEOs have on company performance changes over time and by geography. Um, and there's some really nice sort of work that's been done that actually shows that CEO effect has increased in the United States. So in 1969, um, it's been found that 10% of uh, sort of the explanation of an ind individual company's performance um, is explained by the role of the CEO, okay? His actions, his decision-making. And that actually, this has increased so that by 2009, um, the CEO effect is somewhere in the region of 20%. And that's really quite significant when you think about it. Huge multinational organizations, very complex, employing potentially hundreds of thousands of people. You have an individual at the top of the organization that is able to impact its performance by up to 20%. What we also find is that this changes quite significantly across geographies, and this is sort of the graph on the right that shows that actually what, you know, in countries where CEOs have a lot of latitude for independent action, such as the United States and the UK and Canada, um, actually when we measure this, they do have um, more effect on performance for good and for bad. 
Um, whereas if we think about sort of a, um, a, a country and an institutional framework like Japan, where much more influence is placed on teams and groups, um, and there's much tighter governance around the uh, role of the CEO, actually, you know, their ability to directly and personally impact the corporation is much less. But I think in the um, environment in which we're operating, uh, in the sort of the North American, UK, Anglo-Saxon environment, the CEO really does significantly matter for company performance. And this has grown over time, hence why we now see and, uh, you know, we spend much more time thinking about their role in public discourse and debate. I also want to touch on sort of why CEOs matter and think about this as a political economy story. Um, if we look at the UK example and we think about the top 100 UK public companies, um, well, recent data from PwC shows that these companies, they employ about 6% of the UK's workforce. They contribute somewhere in the region of 30% of the country's tax and that each of these companies in turn supports about 6,000 small businesses through their supply chain, okay? So these are really significant economic actors and the individuals who are running them are therefore able to exert quite a significant amount of economic power within, the, within their sort of sphere of influence. I tried to sort of identify similar stats for Canada. It wasn't, I couldn't find directly comparable um, statistics, but it kind of shows a similar story that large businesses are, you know, they're significant in terms of their contribution to GDP, their contribution to employment. Um, some statistics I found indicated that probably the largest companies in Canada, that top 100 group again, employ somewhere in the region of 13% of the workforce. Um, I think there's also a really important set of debates when we think about the national economy um, and the role of sort of the quality of management and leadership is around productivity. This is now a very significant debate in the UK, um, basically because the UK has a productivity problem. Um, it you know, has been struggling to raise productivity now for quite a long time. And there's some really nice work by Bloom and Van Rienen that directly shows the relationship between the quality of management and sort of management and corporate leadership and productivity returns and that you know for example in the UK the problem with productivity is closely correlated with low quality management and leadership so in this matter as well we can also think about sort of the importance that the CEOs play in their sort of national economy setting um, both as employers as taxpayers um, you know, driving these value chains and these supply chains and contributing to these key economic development drivers such as productivity. Finally, I also want to think a little bit about the sort of um, the issues of their position within society um, and sort of ideas that surround CEOs in terms of social mobility. Um, and there's sort of quite two sort of quite distinct sort of narratives around this, around the extent to which we think of um, sort of corporate elites and, you know, being social elites or political elites as well. Um, and there's one sort of strand which sort of views them as basically interchangeable, that corporate elites and social elites are the same. They're often sort of, you know, the corporate elite comes from the social elite, and this is predominantly therefore dominated by hereditary factors. So race, gender and class will determine your pathways to the top, your capacity to rise to the top of the corporate the ladder is based on your sort of social position, if you like. And of course, then there is this very sort of counter position to that, which is that actually progression up the corporate ladder enables social mobility. And this has been the sort of the big American narrative, the rags to riches story that, you know, you can progress up the corporate ladder through hard work and your own ability, and this will push you up into the social elites. So actually a lot of um, sort of the motivation and the antecedent for the work we've conducted was done in the US in the 1950s, actually starting earlier than that, um, by social scientists who really wanted to test this hypothesis out that, um, you know, that social mobility was a function of, you know, corporate mobility. Um, and they constructed big databases of US corporate leaders and their social backgrounds. And it did show that actually, you know, there was a progression from a predominantly WASP, Ivy League sort of um, elite uh, dominance of corporate elites in the early 20th century, and it did become more diverse across the 20th century. 
This is very important in the UK as well, um, where there's been this sort of narrative that corporate elites, particularly in the early part of the century, were dominated by social elites, particularly aristocratic elites. Um, and that they sort of like were able to sort of control corporations. Alfred Chandler, the famous business, American business historian, he sort of saw this as a distinct UK problem where the UK had a model of what he called personal capitalism, where family dynasties embedded in the social elite controlled the large corporations. Um, and this really limited the ability of these firms to grow and innovate. So I think sort of social mobility is important, both as a societal, you know, idea of sort of fairness and the capacity for people to move up through their own abilities, but it also then matters for corporate performance as well. You know, our ability to have diverse people from diverse backgrounds in these roles may actually be a stimulus and a spur then to uh, innovation and growth. So my perspective is that CEOs really do matter. They're immensely important individuals, both in terms of their ability to drive corporate performance, company performance, their importance within their national economies, and now increasingly within the global economy and within the societies in which they operate. So I think it's, uh, you know, they're really important individuals. And it's based on these sort of factors that drove us then to undertake this work. Um, looking then at sort of the long run sort of evolution of CEOs in Britain across the 20th century. So this was a sort of a, a part of a project um, sponsored by the Leverhulme Trust. Uh, Leverhulme himself was a great British industrialist of the early 20th century. And so we have been, you know, this is actually through his philanthropy that our work has been supported. So again, an important work that these individuals play in society. Um, and what this enabled us to do was to develop a database of, um, first of all, sort of the top 100 largest publicly listed companies in the UK um, by market capitalization. And we look at these um, companies and we rebalance our sample every decade between 1900 and 2009. And this gives us somewhere in the region of about 500 individual firms that we look at. We then, for each of these firms, in each of the firm years, we look to identify who is the CEO, the corporate leader of the firm using stock exchange yearbooks and uh, directory of directors. Um, and this gives us somewhere in the region of 1,700 CEOs that we then investigate. Now, for each of these individual CEOs, we then use a sort of a very non-standardized range of um, sources. So we're looking at obituaries, biographies, interviews, all sorts of different sources to try and construct a sort of biographical details on these CEOs. So we try and understand their social background, their education, their careers, how their careers progress, um, you know, how they're structured, how they exit their careers, um, and sort of further in, uh, details around the sort of the role itself and how that changes over time. And so what I'm going to sort of talk about then sort of to link these sort of two elements together, why CEOs matter and how this changes, then sort of three sort of big pieces of work we've sort of taken out of this is thinking about who gets to the top. So what are their characteristics? What's their social background? What's their educational background? What kind of pathways do they take? What sort of professional development do they have? Um, sort of how do their careers progress? Um, and then sort of what is the pattern of their career? Um, you know, what's their tenure? How do they exit their career? And I think these are all important factors shaping how and why CEOs matter and how this is changing over time. So this is sort of looking at this from a sort of a UK experience, but I think there's probably a fair degree of similarity, although there may be some quite striking differences as well, with sort of um, a North American, US and Canada experience as well. So what I'm going to do is just give you some highlights um, of this uh, of this research. Um, so the first of all, I'm going to sort of look at the social backgrounds and I'm going to give you a couple of exemplars um, from each side of the debate and then show you what our data actually says um, with regards to these debates. So first of all, you know, with regards to the social backgrounds of CEOs, 
Um, you know, where do they come from? And there's this idea, of course, that in the UK, you know, there was a lot of domination by sort of social elites, by the aristocrats. And so on the right, we have uh, this gentleman, Victor Spencer. He's the first Viscount Churchill. You might recognize the name Spencer. Uh, the late Princess Diana was Diana Spencer. And so, you know, this is an extremely entrenched aristocratic family within the UK. Victor Spencer became the chairman of the Great Western Railways, which is one of the biggest railway companies in the UK. He was educated at Eton, one of the most elite sort of schools. Um, and then he went on to the elite Royal Military College of Sandhurst. And this is a moderately common, I'll show you a moderately common sort of um, trope at the beginning of the century. On the left, we have the other sort of the opposite, the antithesis of this. This is Thomas Lipton. Now, again, you may be uh, familiar with Lipton in terms of Lipton teas. So Thomas Lipton, um, he was the founder and chairman of Lipton's, which became an enormous retail and grocery business in the UK, of which the tea was part of his effort to vertically integrate his business empire. Um, now, he was born in Glasgow in uh, an area called the Gorbals, which is one of the most socially deprived areas, not just in Glasgow, but in the whole of Britain. His um, parents were itinerant agricultural workers who had um, migrated from Ireland. He left school at 13. Um, he would sort of fulfill a whole range of menial jobs, which included him traveling to North America in his late teens, undertaking a range of work before he came back to Scotland, to Glasgow, and began to found his empire. So, of course, here we have the archetypal rags to riches story. He's here in his yachting outfit because what he became very famous for at the end of his life when he was knighted was, um, you know, he loved yachting. He's uh, very big in the history of the America's Cup. This led to him being friends with the royal family in the UK. So he, he was a guy who worked his way up into the social elite. So what we think this is showing to us, our data actually says that um, the entrenchment of the sort of social elite and the aristocratic elite in UK corporate elites is actually, it wasn't particularly pronounced. On the left-hand side, the panel on the left, the um, thick line, that is actually uh, the number of people who uh, were chairman or CEOs of a British company who had inherited a peerage that is a landed title in the UK. That's never more than about 11%, and it declines quite quickly. What we actually found in the dotted line is there were more people raised into the peerage in the UK through their business activity, okay, than there were people who had inherited peerages. So we actually find some evidence here that actually business careers were enabling people to progress into the social elite. On the right, we have a um, sort of a, a, another way of looking at this, which is thinking about those who've been through elite education. So these are sort of the really elite schools in the UK, Eton, Harrow, Winchester, which I imagine would be probably equivalent, say, St. Andrews. Um, here in Toronto, and then people who go to then elite universities, in this case, Oxford and Cambridge. And here we see that there are there is a bigger sort of group, sort of a significant minority, certainly in the 1920s and 40s of CEOs who came out of these. These would have been families who were extremely wealthy, probably had already strong ties into sort of a, a business background. Um, and what we see is about 40 percent um, went to the elite school, 30% went to both an elite school and an elite university. But again, what we see is this changes very quickly and quite significantly after the Second World War, we see a significant drop off. And what we're actually thinking is happening there is that what we see is a rise then in, you know, we have impressionistic, impressionistic evidence that there's a rise of sort of middle class professional careerist executives who are emerging during the interwar period and really come to dominate these roles after the Second World War. And so what we see here is quite a significant change within sort of the social background of um, UK uh, sort of CEOs. The second thing I want to talk a little bit about then is sort of how are they formed? What's their sort of the, their pathway to the top in terms of their professionalization? And again, I'm going to give you two exemplars here. On the left, we have Jimmy Goldsmith, um, one of the great corporate raiders, 
of the sort of 1970s and 80s. He's the uh, Anglo-French businessman. He becomes extremely well known as a corporate raider, um, you know, in, in both the UK and then in the US. Now, he was a serial entrepreneur. He left school at 16. He actually left Eton when he won a horse bet and won £8,000 and decided that he no longer needed any more formal education. He'd actually also been educated for a year at St Andrews here in Toronto, which he utterly detested. Um, and this was his thoughts then on uh, the role of universities and particularly the role of actually business schools, um, their importance for corporate careers. He said, the record of the business universities is not good. People come out with a number of ideas and believe they are grander than they are whereas they are less good than the people who have come up through the ranks. So, of course, this forms this very sort of, again, sort of common narrative. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have these people who believe that actually it's all about experience, work experience, how you progress through a corporation. The, the antithesis to this is then, of course, on the right hand side, this is a guy called Andy Hornby. He's a really interesting character. He's been CEO of three major British companies, which is actually really striking. Not many in our sample would go on having been CEO of one to another. And I think he's one of a probably a handful who have done it three times. He was the CEO of the Halifax Bank of Scotland, Alliance Boots, and he's now currently CEO of what they call the restaurant group. And these have all been at some point FTSE 100 companies. Now, he has gone through this route, which was going to Oxford University, the elite university. He then did his MBA at Harvard, where he was first in his class. He then did his couple of years at Boston Consulting before he then moved on to uh, his career within, uh, the, within banking at Halifax Bank of Scotland. So which of these was more common? If you look at the bottom uh, graph, the uh, thick black line is the number of British CEOs or the proportion of British CEOs who have uh, a higher education degree. And we find this really quite striking that it's not until the 1980s, the late 1980s, really, that more than 50 percent of British CEOs have a have a have a degree, have a form of higher education. This does not really become a prerequisite to these careers until the 2000s. OK, and this is really quite strikingly different to patterns that we see in the US and patterns that we see in Europe, where it is far, far more common for CEOs to have some form of higher education. Now, there are other ways you can think about sort of um, how CEOs are professionally trained. Um, one of the ways that has been sort of regarded as being important in the UK in particular has been people who have been trained as a chartered professional, either as an accountant or an engineer or something in the legal profession. And what we see here is, again, a sort of a slow takeoff, really. The, the, the number of sort of accountants does rise. The number of engineers does rise across the century. Um, but it's not really, again, until quite late in sort of probably 2000 that we would find, say, 50 percent of UK CEOs having some kind of professional training through a chartered body that is really relevant to a sort of a corporate career. So what we think is going on here is that you know, actually the sort of the formal training and preparation of UK CEOs, there isn't really a managerial revolution until very late in the century, until the 1980s. And this is quite a lot later than sort of counterparts in the US and Europe. Um, specialist management education is extremely limited in the UK. The number of CEOs with an MBA um, is a tiny fraction of our sample. And this grows a little bit in the later period, but it's not particularly substantial. So we don't particularly see a managerial revolution um, in the UK. Um, what we see is this slow takeoff that really begins to sort of become important after the 1980s in terms of their career progression. Finally, I want to then just talk a little bit then about sort of corporate careers and how they're structured um, and, you know, particularly thinking about sort of ideas around tenure and exit. So I wanted to give one for the home team here. And so on the right, we have uh, Donald Smith. Lord Strathcona and Mount Royal, who uh, was this sort of legendary sort of uh, head of the Hudson's Bay Company. He spent nearly his whole career within the Hudson's Bay Company. He rose to the position of governor um, in 1889 and he would die in office in 1914. 
Whilst he was doing this as well, he also managed to be president of the Bank of Montreal. He also managed to be chairman of the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. This is the forerunner of uh, BP, British Petroleum. He was uh, a critical player in the foundation of the Canadian Pacific Railroad. So, you know, he's a lifer within this company. He spends his whole career there. He dies in office. Um, and he also does all these other things as well. He's able to contribute to all of these other companies as he goes along. On the left, we have Fred Goodwin. He was CEO of the Royal Bank of Scotland between 2001 and 2008, which is by that time about the average tenure of a CEO. Um, and he's, of course, sacked when RBS was effectively nationalized in the uh, great financial crisis of 2009. Um, so we have on the one hand sort of like, you know, these individuals, very long term commitments to their companies. They spend they have a lot of experience. They spend a lot of time within these roles um, and often they would retire or die in office. And on the left, we have these sort of like these model, which is far more constrained um, individuals who were sort of like, you know, much shorter tenured, um, you know, much more likely to be sacked. And we actually find, you know, this is very clearly sort of teased out in the data. On the bottom, the graph shows, you know, basically the tenure of, tenure of CEOs, the average tenure halves across our sample. The age at which they start the role becomes much younger. It falls from 55 to 50. So they're much younger now with a much shorter position in office. And after the 1970s, what we see is a 300 percent increase in the number of what are called forced exits. That's people who are being sacked or forced out of office. Um, and this is very tightly linked um, and correlated with Margaret Thatcher's liberal market reforms of the 1980s. Um, they have a really significant influence on corporate careers. Um, you know, shareholder primacy, these you know neoliberal doctrines that become very embedded and become really important. Um, they actually sort of it, it, take a really significant effect. This is really where the managerial revolution is happening for uh, UK CEOs. We see similar patterns in the US, although this is occurring a, a bit earlier. And actually, you know, we see similar patterns in Europe. I've seen some data on Dutch CEOs, which indicates this is also happening um, in some European markets as well. So, you know, we think that, you know, there are significant changes in both the social background, the career pathways, the formation of them and the career structures of um, British CEOs across the century. I just want to mention diversity quickly, because this is a real elephant in the room for our sample. We find three female CEOs in our sample, which is, there's all sorts of ways we can think about that, but it's not very good. Um, and actually the progress in terms of the number of female CEOs amongst Britain's largest company, it is glacially slow. So in the bottom right, we have Marjorie Scardino, uh, the chief executive officer of uh, Pearson. She came into office in 1997. Another sort of very big example was Cynthia Carroll in the top right, who was the CEO of Anglo-American um, in 2007. But if you think across now what is almost 30 years, we are now at a point where last year there was eight female CEOs amongst Britain's biggest companies. Um, you know, so this progress has been very slow. However, my sense is that actually this is going to speed up quite dramatically. I think what we've seen from our data is that profiles are have changed and the structure of careers have changed really quickly since the 1980s. And now there is strong market force and the strong social pressure through a whole range of stakeholders who are pressing for this to change. So we anticipate that, you know, we are going to see more, um, you know, female CEOs coming through within the next decade. Um, and part of the way we think we can support this is actually by looking at other significant women in corporate life. So these are just two examples I came across during this research who I found really fascinating. Um, on the top left is Gilbert Beau. She was a legendary French banker, um, started off in the typing pool, rose to become MD of Seligman and C. And then she went on to basically run Jimmy Goldsmith's um, investment banking arm, orchestrating the takeovers, reorganizing his corporate empire. She was a hugely well-known figure in European banking circles. You know, so we can see people, she's not a CEO in that sense, but she is absolutely integral to the sort of the, the decision-making, strategic decision-making making within sort of these large corporations. Um, on the bottom left is a really interesting lady. She, this is Margaret Hay Thomas. She was the second Viscountess of Rhonda. 
Um, her husband was a major industrialist at the uh, early years of the 20th century. Um, he was on the board of many companies um, through ownership stakes and also just as an elected director. Um, when he died, instead of getting rid of these stakes, she actually took them all on. She herself then became director of numerous companies, and she was directly involved with the decision making of them, um, played a very active role. And this is in the 1920s. So, you know, we see that actually there are significant role models around sort of women, um, you know, within corporate life that actually, you know, we need to sort of highlight and emphasize to sort of encourage these sort of these, these trends and sort of move them forward in terms of the number of women in CEO roles. So I just want to summarize then what I think happened in the 20th century and what I think the implications are then for what's happening now and what might happen next. And why, C that why CEOs potentially, you know, why they matter, why they're going to matter as much, if not more, going forward. So Career pathways and social background of British CEOs, they significantly change across the century. And this is influenced by change in industry, change in markets, change in regulations. Um, we think that corporate careers both reflect and enable increasing social mobility. OK, we think that actually uh, corporate careers do play some role as a social elevator, um, professional executives are drawn from different social classes, particularly after the Second World War. So we see this quite significant change. In the UK's case, what we also see though is a very slow increase in formal training and education of managers of large bureaucratic companies. Why does this matter? We begin to think that actually this slow professionalization uh, potentially has quite a strong explanation for a lot of Britain's productivity problems uh, later in the 20th century. And that actually, you know, the failure to sort of really invest in um, the professionalization and preparation of these uh, senior managers does have implications both for sort of individual company performance, but perhaps more importantly for wider economic concerns around productivity. The, the, the big managerial revolution we see in the UK is spurred by the liberal market reforms of the 1980s. And this is sort of that you can see this in different ways. These reforms created bigger, more global companies, more complex bureaucracies, um, more globalized, shareholders were empowered. Um, so you needed a different profile, a different type of CEO to run them. This also the empowerment of shareholders led to more oversight, more governance. In the UK, there's a very particular set of governance reforms uh, from the Cadbury report that sort of play a big role in this. But this leads to corporate careers that were shorter, narrower, more confined and more precarious. One of the more interesting things we think, though, is that actually, although we see these increasingly highly trained and monitored CEOs towards the end of the century, we don't significantly see any improvement in productivity in the UK. The actually the period in which you see the biggest productivity gains in the UK are earlier when we actually see a dominance of these sort of uh, aristocratic amateurs and, you know, individuals drawn from the social elite. If you actually look at the productivity stats, there's a much closer correlation between these groups, which is kind of potentially a bit of a paradox there. Questions that we're interested in and we think that, you know, are going to sort of uh, we need to think about quite closely about what's happening now and what's happening next. There are going to be huge changes affecting corporations. You know, we think about the role of technology, the role of AI, you know, I think this is going to be absolutely sort of integral in driving change within corporations. We can think about ESG, we can think about the future of work. So career progression and professionalization, how people advance through their careers, what's important for them in terms of their training, that's going to have to change. How effective are traditional sort of corporate training methods? You know, the domination, uh, you know, you, you get your degree or you sort of are professionally trained through a sort of an accounting body um, or an engineering body. Um, you know, how relevant is this going to be for preparing careers in this environment? I think that's something we sort of, you know, you know we're beginning to see now. Um, I think it was uh, Ginny Ramitti, the CEO of IBM. You know, she has recently said that actually one of the biggest changes she's made that has improved diversity in IBM is removing the requirement for a degree from a lot of their roles that they're hiring for. So what's actually going to prepare people for their for their progression to the top? I think there's a really big trade off between having younger, motivated, but short termist CEO career structures 
you know, what about CEOs with wider experiences and a long term commitment to companies? Um, you know, what value does that bring? And I think there's this sort of trade off that we really need to think about within these career structures. Um, I think diversity of CEOs in terms of social background and gender is going to increase. I think it's been slow, but I think now we'll see this rapidly change. But I think conversely, diversity of career experience has become far more homogenous. Um, and I think this is a, a significant problem. Actually, you know, we, we, we don't we tend now to see people going from degrees to, uh, you know, these corporate programs, these graduate career programs, and they progress through companies in a very set directed way, um, missing out the shop floor in many cases, missing out significant engagement with sort of key stakeholders. Um, and so actually, we think this could be a real problem that companies might want to think about. And so we think that sort of companies, markets and the states, you know, they all influence the pathways and career structures of CEOs. So actually, you know, we need some very sort of thoughtful sort of thinking about this, you know, about what it takes for CEOs to succeed, what who they're going to be, what their sort of backgrounds, what their career pathways are in the future, if they're going to successfully manage all of these challenges that are coming up. Because these CEOs, they play these huge roles, they're influential for their companies, they're influential in the economy that they're embedded in and then it's uh, very influential in the societies in which they're embedded in so i'm going to leave it there um just hope that's some sort of food for thought um and some ideas you know about how we've been looking at ceos um and their impact uh particularly in the uk but also elsewhere so thank you all michael fascinating research um perhaps i can uh, suggest that if people would like to ask some questions just put your hand up in terms of the um you know the chat function on the on the um on the zoom it uh, seems to work quite well and it goes right up to the top so i can see who you are but let me start off with the first question as i said fascinating research i'm not really sure where i want to start but uh you know in canada and i know to a certain extent in the uk as well we're dominated to a large extent by family owned businesses which would suggest that the the education and peerage would have more of an in, uh, an impact on how they rise through the ranks yeah but but we know from other research uh, done at the Harvard School that over 80 80 percent of CEOs are you know come from within the company and are not necessarily part of the founder's family or anything. So have you found anything? Is that more of a, a yeah. more modernist view of things or? Also, oh, there's this really interesting sort of, again, the Chandlerian sort of view on British firms was that they were dominated by families. Right. And, you know, we do we, we find that about 15 percent at the height, really, between the 1920s and 50s were part of, say, a CEO, part of a family dynasty. Um uh, and we find this quite common. Uh, again, you know, what we find quite interesting is there's quite a good correlation between sort of periods of high productivity in the UK. And actually, we can look at all sorts of companies that transform themselves in quite dramatic ways under family ownership. So we actually think that there's quite there's, you know, families can play a really important role and family companies in career formation you're more likely to touch more parts of the business in a family firm than you are if you're coming straight from the university graduate life, uh, sort of move up vertically up the corporation, actually, you know, so family firms in that sense and family leaders, family, the way they operate can be really useful ways of preparing CEOs. Um, it, it, it's and it's become much less dominant in the UK. So the the family, you know, they really disappear in the nineteen fifty late nineteen fifties, early nineteen sixties. They're pretty much gone. Um, you know, that's part of the early sort of corporate raiding that happens. The big M and A moves of the nineteen sixties that pretty much takes out a lot of the family companies. But we, we we think there's a lot to learn from family companies, and it's really important in understanding how they do prepare leaders. Um, well, it's interesting. In, in Canada, as I said, we still are dominated by family-owned companies, so it's a little bit of a difference. Let me go to Mary and then Howard. Mary, question? Yes, thank you, uh, Michael. I'm always interested in your work. My question concerns the extent to which your data set matches or diverges in, in important ways from the paths to power study that yeah. was done at the Harvard Business School, because they've got the data up and I've looked at the gender 
um, and the women um, aspects of that data set. That's one question. Yep. The second one concerns the information that you have on your CEOs. Yeah. Do you have uh, information on whether they have wives and children? <laughs> That's a really good question, right? So I'll cut the paths to power. So I have all of that. I, okay, I have all third, of that data now. Oh, go on. Sorry. And the third uh, point is um, if you have data on uh, family and children, do you have data on anything that tells us about those women and child care uh, institutions in particular in, in England? So thank yeah. you. Oh, really good questions. Right. So um, Paths to Power, their database is constructed in quite a different way to ours. Um, it's basically, you know, they are picking in, in some ways there's a lot of there could be a lot of selection bias within it would be my sort of first thinking about that. I actually have all of that data now. So one of our next steps is we're going to try and run a comparison um between the us data and the uk data to really tease this out there's actually dimitri has potentially some quite interesting data here on canadian ceos that could be explored i think we'll see quite different patterns um i think even though ostensibly there's these quite similar institutional environments and you know common law, um, you know, liberal market sort of, in, I, I think we'll see some quite different patterns. Um, I think we'll see more entrenchment in the UK. I think there'll be more diversity in the US. That's my impressionistic sense. Um, yeah, I mean, the the thing I would say, the past power though, that it, the way they selected the firms, it was kind of, it was selected um, rather than we've got this systematic top 100 effect. So again, like there's pros and cons to both ways, which I, you know, I could go into, but I mean, it's like, you know, we would think that this systematic way, it, it limits us to this particular group, whereas they potentially actually have a broader spread. And one of the big, in one of the things I'm becoming much more interested in is actually we talk about the top 100, but actually maybe all the interesting action is happening further down. And actually the important stuff that drives productivity and really drives national productivity is not in the top 100, but is in firms 200 to 500. Uh, but that's a question of data. So my colleague said to me as we were going through this, and he, he said to me, because we did, we've got the father's social background. And that allows us to do quite some interesting tests on social mobility that we're beginning to do now. And my colleague said to me, he said, what would be really interesting is if we got all the wives. <laughs> and I said to him, I really wished you told me that six months ago <laughs> before we started collecting the data. And I now already have, you know, 50 years of data that we've already done. But actually, to, on that point, we're quite keen to go back and do that because we think there's actually some really interesting stuff that's happening about marriage and um you know how marriages operate and how this builds networks and how this builds linkages um and you know so therefore how wives you know influence you know a, a certain outcomes around building networks so it, that's actually been on our agenda it's just whether we can get time and resource to get in to do it because we have all the husband we have the um, father's data which allows you to do these tests but that's a really great suggestion you know I, I think there will be sort of an important role played by women and that's what I tried to get to that I'm gonna say you know actually it doesn't it's not necessarily being a CEO it's being in other really important corporate roles and roles that they play uh, and so I think we could extend that then by yeah looking at sort of the role that wives play as well Thank you. Howard, I'm interested to see your take on this research. You know, you've had uh, opportunities to be on both sides of the research here, one with the Seagram family and then uh, and then Hunter Harrison, which who I believe came up through the ranks to to lead the, the railway company. So please go ahead. Yeah, that's right, Rick. And uh, thank you for taking the question, Michael. Fascinating. Uh, on the spousal side with the Harrison story, for sure, the spouse yeah. played a hell of a role there. And, and um, I think in, in many of the 
situations I've been involved in, the CEO couldn't do it without the spouse. And I'm working with one right now who's um, uh, moving into the CEO position, a woman, and she couldn't do it without a supportive husband at home. Um, uh, yep. Just to expand on that. But, but my question is, given what you said at the outset about impact, yep. and I think uh, all of us know that the impact can either be positive or negative, um, on balance, do you have a view on compensation about whether <laughs> it's appropriate or excessive? Yeah. Okay, so that's a uh, okay. So this is definitely not part of our research, and we had a long talk about this. Uh, similar to the wives, comp uh, the wives discussion, uh, we may go back and try and build a long run data set looking at compensation. It's really difficult to do over time. I'll just say the data availability is problematic, and then actually standardizing it to become anything meaningful um is really problematic as well so this is all me speaking not through this research but through sort of other people's research and work on this so carola friedman has actually done this for the us and she has a very sort of long run whole of the 20th century compensation series for us ceos so the data clearly shows that there's a decoupling that occurs in the 1970s, right? You know, and you're going from a multiple of 20 to your average worker to something like 270 to 280, you know, and it's been over 300 within the last five years. Now, there's part of me that can sit there and say, well, actually, if you look at the CEO effect and the CEO effect goes up, and the pressure um, in terms of, you know, shareholder pressure, the, precar the, pr the precarious nature of the role, you could certainly see rationale for CEO compensation going up. But the question, I think, which is really important is, you know, it, is it 20 to 300 or is it 20 to 100, for example? I mean, I, I, you know, what the ability, you know, our, our CEOs, you know, their effect is increasing, but that's for good and bad, you know, so the downside risk is also increasing here quite yeah. significantly. Um, you, you know, I, I think the idea, you know, I think there's, you know, the idea that basically, um, you know, compensation and is addressing the principal agent problem, you know, they've tried so many ways, you know, now of addressing this and thinking about it, and it, you still end up with egregious outcomes and pretty bad outcomes. So I, I'm, I think, you know, there's a case to be made as to why CEOs are paid a lot. Should it be 300 times? I think is very problematic. I think you have to work quite hard to sort of justify that. Um, and I think you also have to work hard at sort of mitigating the downside risk, which is now becoming much, much more serious. You think of these banking crises, you're thinking, again, you know, you think of the lobbying that went on for SVP to sort of say, we're not a big bank, we shouldn't be regulated in this way. And yet here we are on the sort of the cusp of yet another major banking crisis. Now, you know, I suspect there was a lot of justification around pretty extensive compensation packages that were occurring for the individual. But I'm not sure that the downside risk to the economy and society is still adequately priced in here. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, 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 there's part of me that sits there and says, you know, actually, you know, these are incredibly difficult roles there. You, you, you know, to, to, to go back, you know, there's that study in the Harvard Business Review where they got big CEOs and they got their executive assistants to break down their diaries by 15 minute increments to show exactly what they do over say a three month period. And it looks horrific. I mean, it looks like the kind of thing, you know, I could never want to exist like that. They're tough roles. They're really important roles. They're significant roles and they should be well compensated. But I think the problem here is still the downside risk to the economy and society is not adequately addressed in a lot of these compensation packages. That's that's my, but I, you know, this is a sort of a super contentious debate and I'm sure um, other people will have a very, very different take on that. Thank you. Michael, I'm curious whether you saw any difference in terms of the value of the CEO uh, as to whether they also had the position as chair of the board. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we measure that. I've got all that data. So what this is what they call duality, right? Where they yeah. sort of fulfill both roles. And what we actually see at the beginning of the century, century, the most important role is the chairman. So the way they record this in the stock exchange yearbook, they'll say, they'll list the person who they think is running the company effectively. Is it the chairman? Is it the managing director? And then is it the CEO? You know, so the CEO becomes this, you know, this term that is used in the UK really from the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And what we see actually is uh, so chairman really dominate and then they begin to decline. And what we see in the middle of the century is actually a lot of what we think is experimentation. People who are managing director and chairman, managing director, then chairman. We also sometimes see chairman, then managing director. And what we think this is experimentation with the role. Who's really in control here? Who really has ultimate authority in the organization? Um, and by the 1980s, you see the domination of the all powerful CEO, which is the which is the American model, right? You know, they can make the big strategic calls. They make the big investment calls. They become this dominant role. Yes, the chairman of the board can discipline them, but they're not making day to day decisions in the UK. There's actually the Cadbury report that came out in 1992. One of its recommendations was that the roles had to be split. And so we do see you know, it, it had been changing anyway, but we do see a significant decline by, say, the 2000s. You'll see very few dual roles and actually increasingly now less kind of like succession relaying of the CEO into the chairman role, because that was also recommended that that didn't happen. Like one of the last big people would say be Martin Sorrell at WPP and he was chairman and CEO. He'd been the founder and then he was forced to pick and he picked the role of CEO and they gave the chairman role to somebody else until he was forced out. Um, well, as you know, that's that's the model we have in Canada, but still in the United States, it's still quite common where the CEO is also it, the chair. It's, it's much more common. Um, now, what we've seen is actually the correlation with performance and changes in performance isn't that strong in either model it tends not to make a difference uh on corporate performance i think it, i think there is certain issues around disciplining effects um but it doesn't seem to have a huge impact on company performance mm. But it's, it, it does change. It fundamentally changes in the UK. And there's this nice period of experimentation which is going on, which we find very interesting, which we think is them trying to figure out who really do we want running this. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Lawrence, perhaps the last comment to you. I see it in the chat, but others may not see that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for a presentation. Yeah, I put I put something in the chat about productivity and leadership, and that's something that you you touched on. And given the emerging debates about the whole productivity, you know, uh, on both sides of the border, and I know that your your uh, you know your co-author John is very heavily involved in productivity uh, productivity issues, and it just seems to be, you know, a very timely uh, discussion to have, um, you know, about leadership and productivity. That would be the first thing. The second thing, just a comment that I think, you know, the the, the factors that you put together and the and the data set, etc., uh, would be really interesting for a Canadian, you know, for to uh, examine the kind of Laurentian elites that were <laughs> that have that have dominated uh, this country uh, since the year dot, uh, maybe since the Plains of Abraham, God knows. But uh, but anyway, if you if you'd like to comment on the perhaps on the productivity one, yeah. I'd be I'd be very interested in splendid presentation. Thanks to the CBHA for putting this on. Thank you. So thanks, Lawrence. Um, so the question about productivity and, you, you know, so there is this work that's been done, which is looking at the quality of management, um, which we also think is integral sort of corporate leadership, quality of management, decision making, ability to sort of like organize and orchestrate complex bureaucracies. Right. You, you know, so there's really good work that shows that there's a good correlation between the quality of management and productivity. And again, on a cross country basis, what we see is that, you know, Germany, the US, 
does far better in this than the UK does. And this is now this huge debate in the UK, which, you know, we've been coming back to year after year, decade after decade. We can run this right the way back to Alfred Marshall in 1911, you know, who are basically saying that, you know, your big problem here is that you just don't have good corporate leaders and managers, and that is affecting productivity. Why is this? You know, and then we end up with these kind of paradoxes where we look at sort of the beginning of the century where actually UK productivity is doing pretty well. Um, and, you know, the majority of these leaders are guys who have never had any formal training. Some of them, you know, are coming out of classics degrees at Oxford and, you know, but actually productivity as well. So is that is productivity affected by them or is it just a wider effect of the industry and the economy? We get to the end of the century and we have far better trained, far more rigorously trained individuals in these roles, far better monitored, you know, far more disciplined. And the impact then on um, productivity has been bad. You know, well, not bad, but it's just not there. It's like, you know, it, it it's not, you know, we've not seen this significant uptake. And I think that to me is really interesting. Um, are we training people in the right way? Are, particularly, are we training people in the right way for what's coming next? Lawrence and Schulich and Rob were training them to be excellent leaders. That's, that's what we would say. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I come from an institution that says exactly the same thing, right? You know, <laughs> it's like, you, you, nice one. I think, I think it all has a role. I think it's all important, but I think we really need to think very carefully though, about what these skill sets are, right? in light of what the changes are coming and, you know, how, how we ensure that people actually have a breadth of experience and a, what, you know, a wide vision as well, rather than these highly narrow visions that actually often get formed as people progress up through organizations. I think they become narrower and narrower. Whereas in actual fact, what you want is wider and wider. So that's just my view on it. But it's a, well, Michael, it's a lot fascinating story. topic. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today and sharing your research with us. Uh, you, you can see there's still lots to do and you've got lots of data that you can continue to follow. Um, Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you just in closing as our Secretary General. But uh, Michael, pleasure meeting you and thanks very much for spending some time with us. Thank you all and thank you very much, Rick. Pleasure. Yes, thank, thank you both and thank everyone for attending and specific thanks as well to National Bank Financial for sponsoring our CVHA talk series. We're very grateful to them for doing that. Thank you and uh, look forward to everyone at our next CVHA talks and have a great day.